Welcome back to The Big Show. It's Alex talking to my favourite people, and one of them is a man who's been going for 300 years. He packs theatres up and down the country, and his DVDs sell more than anyone else. Jethro, how are you? Alex, how are you? I'm good, yeah, still good. I've been in Mansfield tonight. I didn't think I'd been to Mansfield before, but the girl on the door, she's a lovely lady, she said I went, came up years ago and did the Ledger Centre, and I wouldn't, perhaps she's right, but... I can't remember it, anyway. <laughs> Do they all run into one? I mean, you've been touring for so many years. Is it hard to remember what you did when? Yeah, you. I, I generally remember a theatre. Um, I can't remember coming to Mansfield. I'm pretty good, really. I, I remember the ways in, and I remember the theatre, you know, the dressing rooms and the set out of the theatre. You, uh, you do remember it. You remember if there's a a pub around the corner where you had a good steak and chips or whatever, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't it be easier if you lived somewhere in the Midlands? Because what I feel bad about for you is when you do anything north of London, it's a flaming long way, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're away for four days this week. We come to Mansfield tonight and then I go down to Hastings tomorrow, then Hailing Island for Warners on Saturday, and then I go back to Oxford on Sunday. But it's worth living down there just to get away. You know, that's where my, my farms are and my horses and that I need that. I need that to, to get away. I spend my lifetime in traffic and, and people. And, and then when you're not actually working, you want to get a mile away from it, you know. What I love about you is you're so brilliant at what you do and so popular, but you do it without any reward whatsoever in terms of showbiz parties or TV appearances. You're not interested in any of that, are you? Hate it. Hate it. Because it's all bull, isn't it? <laughs> you get with a load of entertainment. I listened to it so many years. It's all bull. And most of them they've never ever paid to a half full theatre and so I don't take any notice of any of them you know and if I tell you I was only half full I was only half full you know um, but we don't do that it, um, and I think I've heard it once too often now so I don't even bother listen it's like pubs that uh, are, are always full you know it doesn't happen it doesn't happen <laughs> And this year, more than ever, has been difficult because of the economy. But they tell me comedy's doing great. How is it really? I would say I'm down somewhere between 6 and 10% on seats. Where a theatre used to be packed every seat, now there's a few odd ones. And I think that's fair enough. And people just haven't got the money. The merchandise has gone through the floor. The tape sales, um, uh, as we said, a bit of merchandise on the show, that would have dropped by somewhere between 50 and 70 percent so people haven't got the money in their pocket and that's fair enough let's be fair i mean it's, it's a bit hard out there for everybody now and if they're turning up then whew, i can't expect any more and we all need a good laugh and that's a great thing about your show i just spent some time in the summer at a comedy festival and it was just hideous to me there were no jokes it seems like comedians don't like telling jokes anymore no um well the, the modern day comedy is a different different thing and i i don't quite see the comedy and i could never do it um um, I worked with, with Jimmy Carr at the uh, NEC a couple of three years ago and and Jimmy didn't understand my comic, uh, comedy and I didn't understand Jimmy's and I, but we both went well on the night so uh, the people enjoyed both so that was, that was fine but I, I just don't, don't see it but with, with the comedy of the old with like Ken Dodd and, and, and the great Mick Miller and Johnny Carson and myself and we people if you come to see a show, there's a little package, a little, the little story. There's a start and there's a middle and there's a punchline at the end. And people can come, listen to it and go back to work the next day when they're sitting, having a cup of tea with their workmates and they can make them laugh. So they can become entertainers, stealing a little story from us old type. Uh, the new boys, you can't quite do that because they're in, they're in a little package. It's a situation sort of observing thing, isn't it, really? Um, some of it's very funny too. I think you've got the mind of a genius because you think of all these peculiar things that are instantly funny. How do you do it? You, you can take a story. Um, I don't need a big story. I can listen to a story in the bar and it's rubbish. <laughs> it's rubbish, you know, and, and nobody laughs and it's rubbish. And then sometime in my quiet moment, when I'm driving around the farms or what I'm doing, I start to think about that. I think, yeah, that could be, and, I, and I, I rewrite it. And if I never entertained the public again, I would still rewrite stories, not as a job, just for my own pleasure. And I've rewritten stuff, and I've had to pull in and laugh because I hadn't heard it before either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I do enjoy taking a word, and sometimes you take a story, and there's too much talking after you deliver the line. So, right, I say, right. If you deliver the, the, the final line that makes you laugh, then shut up. You've got to be, the funny bit got to be as possibly late in that story as it can be, that, that, that still makes sense. 
and then you will shut up and let the just click in the people's mind but if you go on talking after you've done that they will forget that and they will be listening to what you say um and stories can be can be ruined by being too long um a man once said many many brilliant pictures have been ruined because the artist didn't know when to put his brushes down and he said they would have been brilliant but he went on that bit too long so you it's a, it's a little thing you learn over the years um, it's like a boy that came in the club and he was going to tell some Irish gags and he said now is there anybody in from Ireland well there's nobody in my club from Ireland down in Cornwall is it now he's in trouble because there's nobody there from Ireland and are you from Ireland and he not only if he asked the, the, the public a question and given them the right to talk and when he's telling the story in a minute, they're going to say something when they, perhaps you didn't need it, but he's invited them to speak. So don't do that. So don't, no, no, don't invite them to talk because they could, <laughs> they could ruin the whole show. So when he came off, I said, listen, you've got to learn. You don't ask if there's anybody in Ireland or Portugal or Poland or wherever. I said, because if there's not, you're in trouble. So what you do is you, you tell the crowd, he said, little gentlemen, we're delighted tonight. We've got some people in from Ireland, all the way from Dublin here. Isn't that lovely to have some <laughs> Irish people here tonight? Because I was in Dublin last Friday, and you're away. You haven't asked them a question. Everybody knows there's people from Ireland or the, or the Galactic or wherever you like the moon. <laughs> Tell them where they're in, and, and little tricks you learn over the years. There's two things I love about you. Your glint in your eye and the fact that you never seem to get bored of hearing your own gags. I find that infectious to find a comedian that enjoys delivering his material. You, you do yeah. love your gags, don't you? I, do, I wouldn't need an audience. I could go out tonight <laughs> and do two hours and totally entertain myself because I only need help. No, no. The, um, no, no, it wouldn't matter. Um, when I'm telling the story, if I'm in a shop, I'm in the shop, I can see it as vivid as I'm looking at you, Alex. Um, so I'm only really telling you what I see. And, and I, sometimes I start to think about the ridiculous situation and the ridiculous story I'm telling. And I thought, this is absolute madness. And I start to laugh. I cry sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I got a thousand people looking at me and I'm crying laughing. And I'm the only person <laughs> laughing. <laughs> the only thing about you, though, that we do need to point out, you are a bit unprofessional. And I don't really want to do this in the middle of an interview. It's unfair because I've asked for your time. But you come on the stage a bit grumpy, don't you? You're not very pleased to be there in the beginning. Oh, it's all in an act. And it's like Sean, the singer, I really, I really hammer him. But yeah, then I let him get his own back. And it's pantomime, isn't it? You know, the big name, the man about all to say, and they've been shut up. And that's good. That's it's good. lovely that you come on stage and everybody goes, ladies and gentlemen, it's lovely to see you. I'm glad to be here. You'll say, no, I'm miserable, I'm unhappy, I'm yeah, poor, I've yeah. come here, I've fought through the yeah. traffic, and I can't be bothered to be here. Yeah. <laughs> something, something terrible has happened, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, but then the people over there, they know that it's nonsense, absolute nonsense. And I, I, what amazes me, Alex, I start to tell a story, and, and um, I'm really serious. And I was in the beautiful little church in our village, and, and I tell these lovely stories, and people think, <laughs> well, isn't that lovely? You're really serious. And in the end, it's an absolute <laughs> nonsense. It's all not. So they, you would think that they would learn not to trust you. <laughs> and two minutes later, I'll do it again, and they trust me again. Why do they trust me the second, and the third, and the fourth? I can never understand that. Because there are times on stage where you literally break down crying. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Oh yeah, sometimes I can't get the work because I've been emotionally uh, disturbed by the situation. <laughs> Where are you happiest, on the back of a horse or on the stage? Oh, I love entertaining people. I shouldn't be in. Sh I'm an entertainer, not a, not a, um, a celebrity. I, I don't. I'm no part of that world. I got no interest in that world. Um, and I think you you become somebody when you walk on stage. You become somebody else. You become an actor, and that's that part of your being comes out, and you love being that part. Um, away f from that, then I'm a totally different person, totally different man. Um, and I love the simple things in life, I really do. And have you got the balance right now where you don't need to work every day like you did in the beginning? You can enjoy your life on stage and most importantly off. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of these people that's never happy. When I'm home, I want to be away. <laughs> when I'm away, I want to be home, you know. So I, I'll never, ever retire. Never, ever. As long as I can stand up and talk, 
then I will be there. And if people don't come to see me, that's fine. As long as I've got a stage, I'll do it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got characters as well. This is what I love about you. We never get to see them or meet them, but you're forever talking about them. Well, there's Denzel Pemberthy and Silver Long Chavascus. <laughs> Have you seen Lord Chabogus? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It's Lord Chabogus. He, oh, he's a nasty. The funny thing, we was doing a sketch for the, for the video, and uh, Tucker was on. Tucker's a very talented comic, very good boy. Tucker is. And anyway... I said, look, when you're to play this part, I, I've envisaged this, this, this old man. This, he's a sort of man that been left with an estate. He's worth millions. Everybody hate him. He think the whole world revolves around him. He makes his own laws. And he's, you know, you know, the old fella. And I was trying to get Tucker to play the part of this man. I said, look, and I couldn't quite explain to him what I wanted. And Tucker said, well, look, I'll tell you what to do. You know what you want. Let me do your lines and you be him. I said, oh, we'll do that. And... <laughs> Oh, he's the most disliked person ever, Lord Chabogas. Um, oh, he's on one of the videos. He'll be on this one as well, the new one we just done. Oh, he's an objectionable man. He really is. <laughs> he really is. But he's great. How do you think of things like Slip Along Travascus? I mean, they're just incredible thoughts that come into your head. Well, I mean, we're only talking about um, people in Cornwall, really. I mean, Denzel Pemberthy was part of two people. One was called Pemberthy from St. Ives, and the other one was called Denzel, who was a fisherman in Newland. And years ago, if you, if you say a man went in a pub or a, a bloke in the street did this, it becomes a, a gag. If you put a name to it, then it becomes a true story. And when it comes to a true story, to me, it's funnier. And two people made me laugh. That was uh, Denzel and, and this Pemberthy from St. Ives. And just for the want of a name, years ago, 35 years ago, I put the two together. Just off the top of my head. <laughs> Denzel Pemberthy. And I told it was a, a gentleman's show with strippers and all that sort of thing years ago. And um, I told them about Denzel Pemberthy. And at half time, we had a break like you do, the boys would come and said, let's hear a bit more about this Denzel Pemberthy. Because they could associate with him. Because they knew somebody like him. And they had a warmth for him. And I've always treated Denzel with, with kid gloves. I've never let him come out of character. Uh, when we've done televisions, we've had producers say, we'll, we'll get an actor to play Denzel from birth. And I said, never in a million years. Never, ever, ever will anybody ever play Denzel because there would be something about that person that people wouldn't like. And it would ruin that little, that little bit of imagination. They've got that picture of that man in their minds and we leave it there. You must hold your head in shame when you see what length stars will go to these days to be in the papers and to get known to sell DVDs. What is amazing about you, as long as I can remember, there's been a Jethro DVD in my Christmas stocking, as there is in most dads and uncles. How do you do that when you don't talk about it? People just seem to know you're there. Yeah, it's just, um, I've, I've got a great following. I mean, the same people have been coming to see me now for, oh, 20 years. The same people, if I go to... Places like Skegness, the first 25 rows of the same people that was there last year. And, and they want a new gag to take home. And I do attract the rural people a little bit. If I go to a town that, or a city that's too far from the rural side, I don't do a great bit. I don't work in the middle of London. But um, people like Skegness, you get all them farmers in. They probably only come there once a year. You know, so they, they are lovely. And, and I would enjoy them as much as they enjoy me, for sure. Congratulations on being you. You know I'm such a big fan and it's so nice to see someone who's so passionate about it and good at it and still able to fill theatres because it's not easy. I mean, you and I both travel around these places and half the time they're, they're mostly empty. The business isn't good at the moment. There's a lot of good acts out there um, that, that could do with a bit more work. Um, a lot of them are on the ships now and good acts, I mean seriously good acts. Um, there's an act, a, a tour there now and when I look at the lineup, I think... Every one of those those people on that bill should fill a theatre on their own, in my opinion. Brilliant people that I got total respect for, um, and they're, uh, they're they've combined to, to do it. You know, and that, that that is wrong. Could you leave us with a little Jethro story? Yeah, could. Well, we see. I went to the doctor and I said, I think my wife is deaf. You know, and he said, Well, how deaf is she? I said, Well, I don't know. You see. Well, he said, When you get home, he said, Test her out and then come back and tell me how deaf she is. He said, get 20 feet away and say, what's for D, dear? And if she does answer, then walk five paces close and say, what's for T, dear? And then go walk another five paces. Say, what's for T, dear? And he said, tell me how far you are when she actually answers you. So I said, right. So I got home, I got 20 feet away. And I said, what's for T, dear? Nothing. 
So I got to 15 feet. I said, what's for tea, dear? Still nothing. So I got to five feet. I said, what's for tea, dear? She said, I've told you three times, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Jethro, thank you. Lovely, isn't it? Oh, great. Lovely to talk to you, Alex.